Um, I, I don't think I'll put on the, the microphone. Can people at the back here? Okay, thank you. Um, it's a sign of ageing um, when you have to take on and off glasses um, more than anything. Um, one of the other things, I never thought I'd ever attend a meeting when I would hear the words Wagner, Shakespeare and Aubrey in the same sentence. So, <laughs> thank you, Wagner. Um, how in eight minutes can one encapsulate Aubrey and supposedly the impact on, and I prefer the term for, the British Association for the Study of Community Dentistry? I'm not sure, but I'll give it a go. The easy part is the descriptive element. Founded in 1973, Basgod provided a forum for debate and dialogue on all matters surrounding dental public health. Aubrey was there and the input was considerable. Between 1983 and 1987, he was a council member. In 1985, he was appointed as president, and in 2006, the rare honor, he was given life membership in recognition of his outstanding achievements for the organization. But as he often highlighted, always remember that alongside what may be termed the quantitative elements, there are the qualitative elements of any work. And I want to use three H's, the first of which to highlight is humility. For me, I think this is where Aubrey's contribution was the greater. How many of us can remember the fear following a presentation that one had made as he rose to ask a question? <laughs> Highlighting the shortcomings in whatever we had struggled to put together. But most importantly, it was what followed. The end was most important. The making of suggestions of where a piece could be improved. Indeed, for those of us listening to presentations, it was a considerable education to follow the logic and the argument that he made. I first met Aubrey over 30 years ago when he gave a lecture to the master's degree students in Birmingham. Um, and Jill Bradnock, who organised the course, is here today. Here was this professor from London telling us how dentists were doing harm. Well, for a numpty like myself, this led to a challenge. And the outcome at the end of a considerable discussion was, are you interested in a job? <laughs> the impact and contribution on me, the recognition and summarised by Hemingway, there is nothing noble in being superior to your fellow man. True nobility is being superior to your former self. Humility. The second H I want to suggest to people is horror. Travelling with, uh, with Aubrey, abroad or at home, was eventful. There was Riga and the footprint in the sand, but the most eventful was the trip in the DAF 33. The DAF 33 was a small car, but Aubrey had offered Richard and I a trip to Holloway College for the British Society for Dental Research, that we both felt it appropriate as junior lecturers to accept. The tour around one of London's finest roundabouts, at least <laughs> twice, with articulated lorries parping away, we occupying the back seats and the driver, driver seemingly oblivious of the outside world. Public transport became de rigueur, as for us going forward. The third H is home and Helena. My wife had the pleasure of staying with Helena and Aubrey during the Paralympics in London. She recanted stories of the kindness, description of the homeliness, and love for each other, and for the sheer thoughtfulness, and for Anne, that is something that neither of us can ever forget. This is the wider individual. Aubrey was always more than his work. You think of John Kennedy's book, A Confederacy, Confederacy of Dunces, became famous after his death. Indeed, a small aside, but the book's title refers to an epigraph of an essay by Jonathan Swift that in my view sums up how I see Aubrey. When a true genius appears in the world, you may know him by this sign, that the dunces are all in confederacy against him. <laughs> but in addition to Tool, 
Edith Holden, an unremarkable lady who drowned in the River Thames. In 1977, her manuscript, The County Diary of an Edwardian Lady, became a bestseller. Stig Larsson, The Girl Who Kicked the Hornet's Nest, became the best-selling book in the United States in 2010, after his death. Edgar Allan Poe, living and dying in poverty, as no one seemed to appreciate his work until after his death. Plato, The Republic, all became renowned for their work after their deaths. Aubrey exceeds those people, in my view. Ray Bradbury in Fahrenheit 451 wrote, Everyone must leave something behind when he dies, my grandfather said. A child or a book or a painting or a house or a wall built on a pair of shoes made. Or a garden planted, something your hand touched, some way so your soul has somewhere to go when you die. And when people look at that tree or that flower you planted, you're there. It doesn't matter what you do, he said, and as long as you take charge something of from the way it was before you touched it into something that's like you after you take your hands away. We all have two lives, the physical in which we exist and ceases on our death, and the legacy that we leave behind which may remain. The great leave behind the legacy. Aubrey may no longer be here physically, but he remains with an extraordinary legacy. He touched us all, helped shape us, and most importantly continues to do so. A remarkable individual that so many owe so much, yet saw, sought so little in return. <laughs>